All right, so I think we can go ahead and get started. So hi, everyone. My, uh, thank you so much for joining us. My name is Maeve Snyder, and I'm at the North Inlet Winya Bay National Estuarine Research Reserve in Georgetown, South Carolina, and I'll be leading our panel discussion today. And I see our awesome panelists popping on screen, so thank you all for joining us. Um, I'm going to give a quick introduction. I'll give some tips for the webinar platform, and then we'll do introductions um, to our speakers before we jump into the panel. So uh, today we're starting off the 2022 Waccamaw Conference. The Waccamaw Conference is an annual educational event in the Waccamaw watershed, and it celebrates the Waccamaw River and the importance of our water resources. So this year's conference theme is the CWA at 50, the 50th anniversary of the Clean Water Act. Um, the Waccamaw Conference is organized by the Waccamaw Riverkeeper Program of Winyaw Rivers Alliance, the North Inlet Winyaw Bay NEAR, and the Coastal Carolina University Waccamaw Watershed Academy. There you go. All right, so I just wanna give a few tips for Zoom webinar today. Um, so for everyone watching, you are on mute and your webcam will be off during the webinar. Um, we suggest closing any other programs to improve your connection. And if you are having any technical problems, one of the best things you can do is just leave and rejoin the webinar through the same link that you used to join. And you can also ask for help in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. There should be a control panel. So feel free to um, send a chat for any uh, questions. All right, so once again, welcome to the Waccamaw Conference. Um, we actually kicked off this week-long conference yesterday with a jump into clean water at the Conway Marina. Um, and so this was a really great event. We had students doing a cleanup. They picked up a bunch of trash. Um, and I am still wide awake from the cold water of the Waccamaw River. Um, so we're gonna jump into today's panel discussion, which is um, one of several events we have going on this week. So our panel today is Over the Hill, evaluating the Clean Water Act at 50 years. So we're asking the question of how has the Clean Water Act been successful and where do we go from here? A 50th anniversary is a good opportunity to critically reflect. And um, so we're gonna look at that question for the Waccamaw Watershed today. We have a wonderful panel of expert speakers um, I'll give a quick introduction to our speakers and they can expand a little bit more on their work and their background. We do encourage questions. Um, we're gonna have some guided discussion at the start of the webinar, but you can put questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen at any point, but we are gonna get to those questions towards the end of the webinar today. All right, so I'd like to introduce our panel of speakers today. Um, first up, we have Kelly Hunter Foster. She is an environmental attorney and advocate with more than 20 years of regulatory experience and litigation experience. Uh, she's the senior attorney at Waterkeeper Alliance, and she joined that organization in December of 2010, and she currently manages Waterkeeper, Waterkeeper Alliance's Clean Water Defense and National Pure Farms, Pure Waters campaign. Our next speaker is Peter Robb. He is the Southeast Region Director at American Rivers. He focuses on state level policy in the areas of water quality and water quantity, climate adaptation, and restoring natural function to rivers. His work advocates for more natural solutions to manage polluted stormwater runoff and using limited clean water in the most efficient ways. Peter joined American Rivers in 2001 and moved to North Carolina in 2007. Uh, finally, Zach Buer is the Land, Water, and Ocean Project Manager for Conservation Voters of South Carolina. He grew up in the South Carolina Low Country, and his passion for conservation was born in South Carolina's salt marshes and maritime forests. 
His latest project, Apparent Winds, was a global sailing journey documenting responses to climate change around the world. He's now back in Charleston with a newfound appreciation for our state's natural beauty. So thank you to all our panelists for joining us today. We're really excited to have you here. And with that, I'm gonna stop sharing the screen so that we can just have a discussion. All right. So I wanna kick things off with a question for each of our speakers in turn. And I just wanna start by thinking about the Clean Water Act and what it means to you and your work. Um, no particular order. Kelly, you're off mute. Do you wanna go first? Oh, sure, absolutely. Well, um, so many different things. Uh, the Clean Water Act is really important to the work that I do at Waterkeeper Alliance because our focus is, you know, restoring and protecting the nation's waters. And so that largely depends on the Clean Water Act itself. It provides tools for participating in Clean Water Act decision making, challenging decisions when they're not protective of water quality, and providing, you know, the standards and tools that we can use to do restoration. Me personally, um, I struggle to always explain to people who may not know what the Clean Water Act does because we're kind of in a lot of ways spoiled. Um, it, we've, we've got these standards in place that are protecting our rivers and streams and, and people maybe don't understand how we got to the place where we are, which isn't perfect, but we've definitely made a lot of progress. And so as a person who loves to be in and on the water, having an idea about what the standards are for what's safe for being in the water is really important. Um, and uh, I guess being able to look to monitoring data to be able to assess that. Awesome. Um, Peter, do you want to go next? Sure. Hey, y'all. Uh, good to talk to y'all today. Um, yeah, I mean, the Clean Water Act is just an amazing tool that we've uh, sort of inherited from, you know, our parents and grandparents. And I mean, I think it, it is, it is a space of, you know, of, I won't say it's like the root of so many of the things that I count on, but it is, there's a lot of sort of philosophical things that come out of it. And I think Kelly talked very well about the value of its legal structure. Um, but I think that there's a space in which, you know, we say, that, I mean, it says we're going to have a swimmable, fishable water, and that that is something that we as a country value. And so I think that is one of the underpinnings for me, at least, where I really value is it sort of sets a norm of like, look, you can go into any decision maker's office, regardless of their political strain. You can say, I like clean water and I hope you do too. And pretty much no one's going to say, I, actually, I really love the polluted water. Um, you know, I mean, and so I think that there is this underpinning value that we've gotten from the Federal Clean Water Act. Um, that really helped guide a lot of the sort of work that we do. And then we've been able to use it to really get down into some of the nitty gritty pieces that are really causing health problems or causing, you know, otherwise, you know, ecological problems and, and a lot of the other pieces to it. I mean, I think, you know, American River is one of our taglines is rivers connect us. And that's because water touches so much of what we do. And so I think there is a space in which, you know, whether it is, you know, I, I'm in North Carolina, but the Waccamaw and the Lumber River and the PD and the Yadkin, I mean, these are all coming right down um, in, into that same area and it's connecting, you know, where, where I am to where y'all are. And I think that there is a, there is something about the Clean Water Act that helps pull people together into that space. And so for me, that's really what it, it is most meaningful about is sort of that grander philosophy around um, the value of clean water that we have as a nation and as a sort of cultural identity. Awesome. Zach, what does the CDWA mean to you and your work? Yeah, I mean, I'll echo a lot of what was said by both the other panelists, but I, I feel lucky to have never known a world before the Clean Water Act. I mean, growing up, rarely did I ever worry about jumping into a body of water or fishing out of a body of water. And before the Clean Water Act, that wouldn't have been a luxury that, that I had. So um, to have never known a world pre-Clean Water Act is, is I think, really um, a luxury. And then in terms of 
the work that we do, um, like, like Kelly said, it provides an incredible framework for tackling some of the, um, the biggest problems that are facing us in terms of water quality. And, and specifically what we've been focusing on uh, lately at CVSC um, around PFAS, there's a lot of really incredible tools baked into the Clean Water Act that we can um, apply directly to emerging contaminants that the Clean Water Act couldn't have even ever dreamt of. Zach, that was a perfect segue. You touched on an idea of how the existing toolkit of the Clean Water Act can be applied to emerging issues. And I think we'll come back to that. I wanted to set the stage a little bit more because I also have never lived in a world without the Clean Water Act. And Peter mentioned that's something that was passed down to us. Can any of our speakers just give a little more context context of what it was like before the Clean Water Act and how things changed afterwards. I think an example many people are familiar with is the Cuyahoga River on fire, but can you kind of paint a picture of what, what prompted the need for a Clean Water Act and what effect did it actually have? Should we go in the same order just to make it simple? Sure, sure. Okay, so, <clears throat> so one of the things, I, I, I recently went through the National Archives. They have this huge collection of what waterways look like before the Clean Water Act. Because I had one view growing up where I was um, of how things improved. I, I was only four when the Clean Water Act was passed, but I just told you how old I am. But, um, but you know, there was a, a lag, you know, from passage to restoration. So I did see and was exposed to a lot of polluted waterways. Um, it's extreme. You wouldn't recognize the, the, a lot of the places in the country. They were treated like sewer systems, the rivers and lakes all across the country. There's debris and trash and oil and toxic pollution everywhere. Um, there was untreated sewage. We didn't have a way to treat sewage appropriately in the waterways. So um, really extreme changes happened after the Clean Water Act. It took a while to get there and we still have a ways to go, but a great deal of really obvious visual um, improvement happened. I'll stop. Yeah, I, I'll just add to that. I mean, I think, you know, for people who, so I grew up in New Orleans, about three blocks from the Mississippi River. So I always think about like, I would go up to the levees and look at the Mississippi River and, and there'd be times where I would think about it and as this beautiful, wonderful river, but it still was really muddy. And even in like June, I could feel the cold water as it, I realized that it was, you know, washing down from like Minnesota. Um, and so there was a, there, it, again, it sort of, it took me to the, hey, this water is coming from all over. And I just, you know, always thought about, you know, so I never had the experience as a kid of like just jumping in the water because no one jumped in the Mississippi River. And if you're ever in New Orleans, don't jump in the Mississippi River, you're gonna die. Uh, it's a big river, it's gonna suck you in, don't, don't do it. But it's a lot cleaner now than it was. Um, and so, but I think the, a lot of the policy and the way water was managed was not as a resource at all. It was thought of as a waste product. It was like, oh my God, we gotta get this away from our houses, away from our community, get it out. And so it was really, it wasn't a space in which water was valued as a clean resource because people were like, oh, we'll take whatever the water is, filter it, and then we can drink it. And honestly, we had less, like our health standards were not as good. Um, you know, so there was an, a number of little pieces that, that drove to this. Um, but I think if you talk to people who grew up in the Carolinas, they'll also talk about the like textile mill world in which they would say, Oh, we knew what was being dyed at the textile mills, depending on what color the creeks were running, because the wastewater from the textile mills would just be washed right into the streams. And so, you know, there, I hear all these stories all the time about people who were like, oh, it was red day. It must mean the Levi plant was doing red shirts today. You know, and you're like, great, is that every Tuesday? And they're like, yeah, you know, it's like Tuesday, Wednesday is red day. And you're kind of like, oh my gosh. You know, to think about that now, um, you know, we that is just such a foreign, idea as to how we would experience our water systems. Um, so I think, I think there's a lot of good that has happened for sure. 
Yeah, and and again, I kind of have to look to stories from the Pre-Water Act to get a, a sense of what that was like. But I know here in Charleston, uh, the the dumping ground for the city was right along the river, whereas now that would be unthinkable or at least without protections between that dumping ground and our waterways. And then in my sailing adventure that you mentioned earlier, you know, we sailed into a lot of countries where you don't have that philosophical kind of shared vision of clean waterways that Peter mentioned. And um, the waterways show it, you know, there's trash, you can see oils on oil slicks on the top of the water. It's really, uh, it's unsettling coming from a place where there is that that focus and that uh, dedication to try and keep our waters intact as they're meant to be. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, it is really impactful to hear like what a visual, tangible difference this uh, federal policy made. But here in the Waccamaw watershed, we still have ongoing issues with water pollution and these are a major concern. So is this ongoing pollution a question of proper enforcement and implementation of our existing Clean Water Act or does the act itself fall short of what is needed? So, it's a little bit of both in my view, um, but a large part of, I think what the struggle is, is that the Clean Water Act is a very ambitious act. Um, you know, it said, we're gonna restore the physical, chemical and biological of the, uh, uh, integrity of the nation's waters. And that the primary way we're gonna do that is to eliminate all pollution discharges to, into the nation's waters. And so um, to a large extent, uh, we started making progress with things that were easy, like let's fund wastewater treatment systems. Let's tell big industries to put in technology that they can afford and then sort of back that up with water quality protections into the permits. But we haven't moved to the level that we were supposed to by 1985, which was the elimination of all discharges. We're not even really trying to do that now. I, I don't think. I don't think people think of it that way, even though that's the name of the permit, the National Pollution Discharge Elimination System, Pollutant Discharge Elimination System permit. Um, so I think that to a large extent, the structure of the way the Clean Water Act is written would be effective if there were the resources and the political will to actually achieve its goals. I think that is the, the lack of those two things are the primary reason that we've struggled to achieve its goals. Um, of course, you know, there are one of the biggest problems that we have in the country that's not really addressed at all is non-point source pollution. And that's not really addressed in a meaningful way in the Clean Water Act. And there's some funding and there's a requirement for states to adopt plans, but there's a lack of regulatory uh, authority. And we put a lot of money towards it over the years, but it hasn't really solved the problem and it's a major national problem. So I guess if I were going to change the Clean Water Act, that would be one of the ways I would change it, it would be to figure out some way to start getting at non-point sources of pollution. Yeah, I mean, just, go, just going in the order again, um, I, I would agree with everything Kelly said. Um, I think, you know, early on it was the, you know, rivers on fire, rivers running different colors, you know, people getting sick by having contact with that. And we've made so much progress, but now we've got issues of like, the problems that are in our waters are clear. You know, you look at a water and you can't actually tell whether it's polluted or not because it may have, you know, some of these emerging chemicals in it, it may have carcinogens in it, it may have, you know, other toxins in it that we are not visually or, you know, through smell like indicating. So people look at a lot of these streams and they say, ah, everything is going right. But it's also, you know, you look at the stream and you can also say, oh, everything is not going right because, you know, like the stream that's in my background here, looks really beautiful and all those sort of things, but it, you know, it could be that three days ago it was running 
you know, four feet higher because it rained two inches and we're not managing any of that rain. And so there's a volume part of it. And I think this gets to also what Kelly was talking about, those sort of those three variables of chemical, biological, and physical. The Clean Water Act has paid most attention to the chemical components in our water. And so now we're down to the tougher parts, which are the uh, biological and the physical. And those are a lot tougher from a legal standpoint to really like put in you know, a regulation, put in a policy to say, look, you're going to do this. This is what you need to do in order to get there. So I think you know, from a space in which you know, does the Clean Water Act need to be changed, you know, I honestly argue about with this with myself all the time. Is like sometimes I'm like, yeah, we gotta do all sorts of stuff. And then I'm like, well, actually, I think as Kelly said, you know, it's like there's so much to it. It is such a like audacious law that then it's really I think about, well, it's actually just a regulation that's implementing that law, that's causing that law to do different things that we really need to get into and see, well, what else do we need to do? And that does come down to the political um and financial will, which is also political to do things. So I think that there is, you know is the law in a place to be able to do what we need it to do? I think it is, but I don't think the rules are in a place that are actually causing us to have the change that we need. So um, yeah, so I, I think that there, there's room for growth, even in, even in a 50 year old law, so. Yeah, and I mean, just, just to piggyback off of what both the other panelists said, I think, you know, non-point, source pollution is, is a huge issue and one that you're right, they tackled the easier issue of the, the clear you know, pipe running into the river, dumping pollutants. But now the science has advanced, uh, our understanding of what non-point source pollution can do and is doing to a river has advanced. And I think um, in terms of falling short, that that really is something that either needs to be addressed within the CWA or perhaps with a different piece of legislation, but that seems like a clear shortcoming to me. Um, and then also, you know, in terms of regulating agriculture, um, they've done some work around uh, concentrated animal feeding operations, CAFOs, and understanding the impact that those type of operations can have on um, rivers, but nutrient uh, pollution is, is a huge concern. And until we more comprehensively deal with um, the ag side of things, instead of just a blanket exemption, I think uh, we're going to continue to see those, those shortcomings. Thanks for all those thoughts. And yeah, I mean, there's no right answer, but it seems like there was consensus that within the existing CWA, there is you know, there are tools that we could put to work more, and then there are things that it doesn't address, especially non-point source pollution. So the CWA is federal legislation. Um, I'm wondering if uh, this, our panel has any thoughts on how state and local governments fit into the picture of water quality protect or water resource protection. You want to keep going with the same order? I feel like <laughs> sure, if it works. <laughs> yeah. um, so there are very distinct roles for states, um, tribal governments, territorial governments, and local governments laid out in the Clean Water Act. It's supposed to be a um, cooperative federalism program. Um, it's supposed to all work together towards that same objective that we've talked about. And so there's a few different ways um, that, you know, states, I'll just start with states and tribe, tribal governments and, and territories, they uh, can apply for and um, get approved to implement the program on behalf of EPA, um, all aspects, almost all aspects of it. Um, and the EPA, it, when that happens, the EPA serves in a sort of an oversight role uh, looking at things like um, NPDES permitting, um, regulatory standards, water quality standards, assessment and listing of impaired waterways, um, adopting TMDLs. Um, they also administer a lot of the funding out to 
government, um, local governments, municipal sources, and other people who are eligible to apply for federal funding. Um, there's so many things. Uh, they, they do a 401 water quality certification. So whenever there's a federal permit that needs some sort of a, that has a Clean Water Act nexus, then the states and, and tribes and territorial governments, would, um, they uh, look at the projects and make sure that they comply with water quality standards and other related state laws. Um, and they're responsible for de developing non-point source plans um, as well. And then local governments a lot of times have an interesting role. It depends on how it's set up. It, you know, the thing that jumped out at me the most is the situation where they have a drinking water treatment system, a wastewater treatment system, and um, the interaction between those and, uh, and needing to get funding and developing the plans and all of that. Uh, but also sometimes they serve as a regulator themselves. If um, they have industrial dischargers that go into the wastewater treatment system, they may have a regulatory responsibility for ensuring that those industrial discharges that go in are not disrupting the treatment process or passing through chemicals in, into receiving waters. I'll stop. That was, that was like doing rapid fire. Here's what the Clean Water Act does. Zach, do you want to go next? Just since you don't have to be, be the caboose always. <laughs> sure, sure. Why not? Yeah. Um, I mean, in terms of how I view them interacting the state and the and the federal government uh, through the Clean Water Act, I think, you know, Kelly mentioned cooperative federalism. And I kind of see the Clean Water Act as the federal floor from which, you know, we can't go below that floor, thankfully. Um, and then states have the ability to kind of kind of build upon that. Um, and in terms of executing the non-point uh, source pollution, you know, I don't know if we're supposed to be critiquing the the act in this particular part of the discussion, but I, I think uh, the way that that's set up in terms of the grant based um, program that they have set up for non point source. I think that that is not nearly as robust. And I think in terms of the interaction between state and federal that the federal government or the federal plan leans a little too heavily on the states um, or maybe expects the states to do more than maybe they're able to, um, whether it's political or actual capacity. Um, so, so yeah, um, just some thoughts on the on their interaction. Cool. The only, I think the only thing I would add is just I think it is um, y'all did a great job covering a lot of, of the ground here. Is you know it's really a question in my mind of who are the goal setters versus the implementers, and I think. You know, if you look at it, the local governments are really the implementers, you know, and they're really working with, you know, their community, particularly around non-point source, but I think it is the, you know, do they have a wastewater treatment plant that's actually doing all the things it's supposed to do that's not just like, so one of the fun things about talking about the Clean Water Act is you get to talk about, like I spent more time talking about poop than I ever thought I would in this job because it's what, it's what happens. If you're not talking about poop, you're not really talking about the Clean Water Act is really what I found. So. First part is you got to get out your floatables. Um, you guys can figure out what all those things are, and then you get into like a bacterial process, and then you can do all sorts of other things. And that's really the local government, that wastewater utility, and that's, they, that's their responsibility. They are the entity that is required for the thing, for that pipe that's coming into the river. Like they've got to make sure that that water is clean enough to make it into that river. Um, and so they really are the implementers. And then the state really is the sort of, you know, I think getting where Zach was is sort of like, that low, like what's that lowest bar that the federal government says? And does the state want to have, like, are there water resources that are slightly better? And so the state says, well, in this, like we have a trout stream here, or we have a beach there that we want to make sure are protected. So we want to have slightly higher standards in those areas. You know, so I think the states are able to sort of tweak things to get to that place if they want to. I mean, I think one of the places that's really interesting um, that, uh, that is creating some interesting conflict around the, the deregulation sort of team that's out there is around flooding. You know, what do we do with our 404 permit? So section 404 of the Federal Clean Water Act talks about wetlands and waters of the US and how we regulate those spaces. And so, and that's huge for flood control. You know, and so, I, so one of the places we're starting to see some really interesting sort of movement is this like, well, 
you know, if we want to build houses, we, we need to be able to fill in those wetlands. But if we fill in those wetlands, we're going to flood these other people and we don't want to have any more impacts from flooding. So maybe we should. And so we're, I'm starting to see like some knots being tied by some folks around that space even. Um, anyway, which is not necessarily part of the partnership for sure, but it is that local, like, how are we, what are we looking at from the space that the Federal Clean Water Act gives us at the state level and the implementation we want to have at the local level via the local governments and the state sort of managing that middle space. Um, and I think that's a really interesting, um, it's a really interesting sort of Venn, Venn diagram right now. Yeah, and I think what you're all getting at is the complexity of the act, the all the different ways it's administered and implemented that has contributed to its successes. And I think, you know, I think everyone here is really appreciative of the success of the Clean Water Act. But like, yeah, we're we're here to kind of critically reflect on it. So, you know, it does also have its weaknesses and drawbacks. And one uh, one area I really wanted us to think about is what, uh, how has the Clean Water Act um, benefited communities and have those benefits been equitable? Have there been differences across demographics or regions in how the benefits of the Clean Water Act have been felt? Um, let's see, maybe we'll go in reverse order. Zach or Peter, you guys can kick it off. <laughs> Sure. Yeah, I, I can I can kick us off. I mean, I think you can't escape the the question of environmental justice. I think no no matter what policy or or what area of in, environmental issues you're looking at, um, it's pretty often that our disadvantaged communities, our Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities are the ones who disproportionately bear the burden of environmental problems. Um, and so when it comes to the Clean Water Act, I, I think that the framework itself is, is not inherently, um, you know, it's, it's not that that is inherently problematic. I think just in terms of, of maybe application, um, you're sure to see some some disparities between um, the application. And now I couldn't honestly find anything specifically saying these watersheds in these type of communities were worse off. Um, but I think, you know, Peter mentioned the, the waters of the United States uh, definition question um, briefly there. And, and I think that that is something that probably comes into play here with um, in terms of environmental justice. If you have waters limited to traditionally navigable waters. Um, these are waterways that are, you know, bigger waterways, clearly waterways, the homes that are going to be, the communities that are going to be lining these traditionally navigable waterways are more likely to be um, wealthy communities, waterfront communities. Whereas I think some of the um, more ephemeral waterways that have been included in the past, but maybe aren't included right now, uh, the wetlands adjacent to these waterways, then you're starting to get into places where maybe the people that live there aren't your wealthiest people, um, maybe are more low wealth or you know disadvantaged in, in one way or another. And those waterways that they're living on are not going to be um, included in, in the enforcement of the Clean Water Act as it stands currently. So I think there's there's more opportunity, especially right now, to see a disparity um, given the way the jurisdictional waters are, are defined. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think that, you know, sort of as, as you said, Zach, I think that the institutional inequities in our society definitely play out throughout in the Clean Water Act as well, um, where you see the you know, the areas, the neighborhoods that are, you know, have larger shade trees are often the more higher wealth, whiter communities where the tree, and you know, it's like, why am I talking about trees? Well, trees are awesome at managing stormwater. They're awesome at like cooling down water. They're awesome at doing a lot of the things that we want from a natural function within a water. Um, and so we just don't see the investment in some of those really basic things that make our water more natural, more accessible 
in low wealth communities of color. Um, and so I think those are, I, I think that that is, you know, that that is, you, you can see it across the country. I mean, you know, there are places where, you know, a downtown has been built and they haven't managed their stormwater. And so the, you know, community that's downhill is inevitably a community of color. And so they are getting flooded out more often. They are getting more water pollution because there's more pollutants that are running off the landscape and into their community. And so that lack of understanding that it is not just, you know, it is just yet another layer of injustice onto a lot of those communities. I, I think it's something that is, is very present. I mean, I think, you know, it brought, it's like you brought up CAFOs, so confined animal feeding operations, you know, they've got spray fields. And I believe those spray fields are near, um, you know, communities of color um, in, in rural communities. And I think that that is, you know, one of the great environmental justice and there should be something more that the Clean Water Act can do about that. And I think, and there are folks who are working towards that and the Watershed Alliance is doing a lot of work on that. So I'm looking forward to hearing from Kelly around this. Um, but I think it's, um, um, we're not Watershed Alliance, Waterkeeper Alliance, I'm sorry. Um, and I think there's, and so I think time and time again, you can see that the people who have had access to the grants, the people who have had the benefits of the act have not been the people have not been people of color and people of low wealth and sort of more historically marginalized communities. So I, I think that there is a, there's a lot of environmental injustice that has been incorporated into the implementation of the act for sure. Yeah, so I think when I, when I first thought of your question, I was thinking, you know, the two main ways that are obvious and easily addressed are um, lack of access to funding, you know, larger communities, communities with more um, political power within the state probably has better access to um, the financial resources historically that were available to put in um, high quality wastewater treatment systems and and fund in treatment for you know big industrial dischargers. Um, that's one thing. And the other thing I think of is, you know, lax or permit standards in certain areas. If you think about what it's like for people that live in Louisiana, where you have a lot of chemical plants and um, refineries and things like this. Um, you know, are the are the water quality standards for the receiving water as stringent? Are the permit, are those standards um, and technology-based limits being put into those permits in a way that's really protective of water quality and the community? Um, so there, that's sort of a, a lack of standards and a disproportionate impact, um, you know, that often isn't considered. And then I think that a lot of those things can come together in areas that have um, a lot of tribal land um, where they, you know, they aren't maybe being fully addressed by the state or the EPA. They're, they're these sort of, you know, jurisdictional, jurisdictional issues that end up with a lot of people not getting the resources and protection that they need and also facing um, the situation I think of is upstream from an area getting flooded, you know, and that being a sort of okay thing to do. Um, tribal lands being flooded upstream from a hydroelectric project. Um, and, and it's already a community that already has a lot of burdens um, in terms of pollution. So um, I think I'm hopeful because everything that I'm hearing when they're talking about all this new infrastructure funding that's coming out from the bipartisan infrastructure law. There's a prioritization of communities that um, uh, and, and people that haven't historically been served as well um, for all of this funding that's supposed to be coming out into the community. So that should help with, I hope, a lot of that. Um, and people can help make sure that happens by participating at the state level. Awesome. I think a lot of the issues we've been describing um, both for um, communities and environmental justice and then the specific you know, environmental issues that we experience locally in the Waccamaw watershed. So like CAFOs, um, like 
you know, concentrated animal feeding operations or um, stormwater flooding from just impervious surfaces. These are all familiar. And I just um, wanted to ask the panelists, can you talk a little bit about how the Clean Water Act has impacted the, Walk the Waccamaw watershed specifically, if you can speak to it. I know several of you are located outside of the watershed or maybe more generally um, coastal rivers of the Southeast. Peter, you have to go first this time. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, that's great. No, um, I mean, I think that particularly around the contaminants of emergent concern, I think that is a place that PFAS and PFAS runoff into the Waccamaw is something that is a big issue. And so figuring out how to update the toxics registry and getting that to interact with the Federal Clean Water Act is a big issue. And I think the, there are groups that are engaged on that and are doing that work. Um, you know, I think the other place that the Clean Water Act is really, I mean, I think it is coming into play in the stormwater runoff where you look at um, American Rivers has been partnering, um, this person by the name of Janae Davis has been down the Waccamaw for a long time uh, and been partnered with the community of Bucksport there and is really helping to drive the, the implementation of their sort of rain garden project there to sort of show like this is, yes, there's a flooding component to it, but there's also a water quality component. And, and some of that funding is gonna come from uh, funds sort of through the Federal Clean Water Act um, in various channels. So I think, you know, there, there are ways like that, that when you look at how the, the act is in place and the sort of opportunities for improving, the, particularly in the Waccamaw, um, you know, I think the other place we, that for American Rivers that, it, you know, where they, it, it's sort of a, a weaker part of the act, honestly, but it's around the, um, so I don't want to say anti-degradation, but source, I mean, we think about it as source water protection, but it, under the Federal Clean Water Act, it'd be called the anti-degradation section where it says, look, the water quality that you have right now is what has to be kept. Um, and one of the ways to do that is through preservation. And so we haven't necessarily used, and, and I don't think it's necessarily being used as a regulatory metric in the Waccamaw, but I think just saying like, hey, people pull their drinking water out of the Waccamaw River, which means we need to protect where that water is coming from. And so, you know, we don't want it to degrade any, any more than it is. And so I think sort of those, those practices sort of investing in the conservation of the watershed, because, you know, that area is, is developing super fast. Um, so there's a lot more people who are moving in there. There's a lot more growth that's happening and that's gonna, and that's impacting the watershed a lot more. So I think that there's, there, there are pieces like that where the act is coming into play to help address some of the problems that the Waccamaw has. <laughs> you want to go, Kelly, or you want me to go? Go ahead. <laughs> okay, sure. Um, I mean, to to speak to the Waccamaw River specifically, I mean, I know that the CWA has been instrumental in, in helping to keep polluters accountable in terms of things like coal ash and, and providing that legal framework for um, groups like like the Winyaw Rivers Alliance, SELC, Scalp, and others to give them that legal framework to push back against, against polluters. Um, so I, I think in terms of the, the point source pollutants and, and how uh, the CWA has affected the Waccamaw River, I think it's, it's just given that framework. Um, and you know, I think Peter covered a good deal and welcome any input from Kelly because I'm sure she's got a wealth of, of knowledge on this as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, the thing I'm most familiar with in the Waccamaw is, is CAFOs, Concentrated Animal Feeding Operations, and you have them, right? And they are not appropriately regulated under the Clean Water Act like they're supposed to be. There's a uh, um, I just looked yesterday, I, don't, I didn't look at uh, um, in the South particularly, but nationwide, 31% of, lar of the largest CAFOs in the country don't have Clean Water Act discharge permits. They claim they're not discharging. They get these protections from state law permits. We also have medium CAFOs that are not getting permits. So, you know, it's impossible to control pollution from CAFO CAFOs if they don't get a permit and, um, uh, the EPA really needs to step up and address that problem ASAP because they are a major, major source of 
not just nutrient pollution, but pathogen pollution all across the country, including in the Waccamaw. That's the short version. Awesome. All right. So this is such a great discussion. Um, I think I want to switch to questions coming in from our audience. We've had people really engaged in the chat, having good discussions and sending in some good questions. Um, maybe just to get to as many questions as we can, we can just pick one person per question for the next 10 minutes. Um, so this question actually came in, someone submitted it in advance and they asked, what are the current threats to the Clean Water Act and what are some future threats that you're thinking about? And I'm thinking maybe Kelly or maybe Peter might be good for this one. <laughs> you have to pick one. Um, okay, go for it, Kelly. <laughs> okay, so current threats to the act itself. Mm -hmm. Current um, future. In future. I mean, the biggest problem that we're, that is sort of universal with the Clean Water Act it are these years long efforts to redefine which types of waterways are protected. Um, and, you know, a sort of a going back and forth, you know, up until 2015, almost every kind of water in the, in the United States was covered by the regulatory definition. And after some Supreme Court cases, the state that the EPA started rolling back in the core, um, which waters would be protected based on guidance, not the actual regulatory definition. And so then, um, you know, then since then, there's been this back and forth and the regulatory um, definitions, none of them, including the current one are perfect or protect enough types of waterways. Um, so, you know, that if we can't, if we don't make sure all the waters are protected, protected, all of our interconnected waters, as was intended by the original, um, you know, people who passed the Clean Water Act, then we can't protect the waters. We can't protect them where they are, and we can't protect the downstream waters. So, in my view, that's the biggest hurdle now and in the future. Because even if we get it fixed, you know, it's sort of has a target on it from industry. They really want to, they really want to roll it back. And there's always that uncertainty of what, what the protections will be. Cool. Thanks, Kelly. Um, all right. We have a question in the Q and A box and um, feel free to add any other questions for anyone watching. Um, I think Peter, I want to ask you what specific Clean Water Act revisions or new legislation do you feel is most needed, um, is the most needed addition to US water quality improvement? So, you know, imagine the political will is there and you've got, you know, a clean slate for what you want. <laughs> I'm all powerful and can just make things yeah. happen and snap my fingers. I love it. Um, no, uh, I, I mean, I think, so, I, First, I think we need to increase the funding for a lot of the programs that are there, because I think one of the biggest issues we face in a community is not like having to do it on the cheap, essentially. It's like, what is the least expensive way that we can get to any of these goals? And that ends up forcing us to devalue the water and get down to a single issue. And so I think if we were actually able to invest in implementation of the Clean Water Act the way it was designed, in the, seven, in the 60s and 70s as it was being put together, um, and even in the 80s and 90s as it was you know, being reformed a couple of times, um, I think it would be a lot better. I think, you know, and I, honestly, I think that would also go to address some of the equity issues around the implementation of the Clean Water Act. And, um, and so, and I think the other place which we sort of touched on um, is specifically around the, around non-point source. So sort of the non, um, pipe and discharging into a river space. So, you know, how water moves across the landscape. And so I think clearly outlining that that is regulated under the Federal Clean Water Act and needs to not just be planned for, but actually implemented to reduce pollution there would be areas where I think there could be some revisions. Now, whether or not that needs to be, you know, Congress passing a law, or if those are revisions that can happen within a regular regulatory structure looking within the, the overall architecture of the Federal Clean Water Act, I, that's the place where I, I, don't, I don't know which is the better way to go there. Um, 
you know, because I think as Kelly was getting to, it's like when you get into the regulation space, we can art like we've been in this argument about like what water is water of the US versus water of a state versus not any of that, because that's all in regulation. If it was just in the law, this wouldn't be a debate because the law would say all the water is regulated. Um, and so, you know, there's an argument to say, well, if you want, if you want to make sure you're clear, put it in the law. Um, so anyway, so I, again, I, on, on any given conversation, I will argue for that and against that all at the same time. So I will stop with arguing that we don't need to change the law. We just need to change the regulation right now in those two spaces. <laughs> well, and it's, I mean, it's a question with no right answer, at least not that we're going to get to the bottom of today. Um, all right, so I want to wrap up with one last question. Um, I want to ask Zach, um, and I've been thinking this whole time about everything you've said about how this, the Clean Water Act really reflects a common philosophy and value that we all have, but because of its successes, we've kind of moved into this new phase where the, issue, the water quality issues we have are more invisible, and that makes it maybe harder for individuals to relate to the needs for it when it's not like as obvious as a river on fire. So I wanted to ask Zach, how does the Clean Water Act impact individuals and what can individuals do to have a role in clean water policy? Well, I think that if individuals are, are looking to have an impact when it comes to uh, clean water policy. I, I think, you know, not too shameless of a plug, getting involved with your river keepers, um, getting involved with the people who are familiar with the issues that are, are plaguing a river. Like you said, it, it's, it's not as blatant as a river on fire, but there are people who work with their waterways and know the problems, whether it's chemical, biological, physical, whatever it may be, they know the issues and they will be able to plug you in um, to a system, to a group, to a community that's working to address those issues. So I think in terms of the individual impact, um, it provides you with the knowledge, A, that a, a river is impaired. That's another thing. I mean, if you go to, um, there's a, a mywaterway.epa.gov I think you can go to and you can type in where you live and it can tell you the status of the waterways around you. So I think um, it does provide that information for the individual to get to know their waterway. So, cause that's the first step, right? Of taking care of things is, is knowing them to care about them then to take care of them. Um, so I think it provides a great framework of knowledge, um, and then there are avenues within that Clean Water Act to take action on that knowledge and, and protect your waterways. Awesome. If I can just add, and I know we're only doing, but just, I would just say one of the really cool things about the Federal Clean Water Act is it allows for citizen lawsuits. Yeah. And so it really does push it to the individual, like even for American Rivers, when we're filing a lawsuit under the Clean Water Act, we've got to go find a person who's been impacted by whatever we're challenging. And, and that person has to say, yes, this change in law, this change in regulation is impacting me personally in order for us to have standing in order to be able to really bring the case. And so I think, you know, I think that is a place where the individual can really engage with the act and really have a really significant impact. Cool, that, yeah, that's a good point. All right, well, I think at this point we should, um, start to wrap up, but the first thing I want to say is just a huge thank you to all of our speakers for taking the time to talk with us today. I also really want to thank everyone watching for, um, for taking the time to be here and to share your questions. If you'll hang on one sec, I want to um, bring up a slide and share some upcoming events for the Waccamaw Conference. All right, how's that look? Good. Good. Okay. So, um, so thank you all again. I just want to let you know we have a whole week of events coming up ahead of us. Um, there's something going on every day. On Tuesday, we're having um, Green Drinks, which is a happy hour event up at Crooked Hammock Brewery. 
On Wednesday, we have a water quality monitoring open house, which is a great opportunity to get involved in volunteering and citizen science. Um, Thursday is all about 50 actions you can take for clean water. And on Friday, we're gonna have a keynote presentation. Amy Armstrong, the executive director of SCELP, is gonna talk about this, um, the Clean Water Act, past, present, and future. And that's gonna be in person at the Horry County Museum. And then on Saturday, there are cleanups happening all throughout the watershed. So there's all sorts of ways to get involved, family-friendly events, in-person events. Um, and I'll also sh share some citizen science and student opportunities. If you are into iNaturalist, you can participate in our bio blitz and we're gonna have some student poster. Um, we're having a student poster contest and you can see all of the amazing artwork they've done on um, the Waccamaw Conference Facebook page. And then we also have um, the conference website, actually Kara or Victoria, could you pop that in the chat if you have a moment, just so people can see all of the stuff going on this week. And with that, I just wanna say thank you again. This webinar will, was recorded. We'll post it on the conference website as a follow-up. Um, and a huge, huge thanks to everyone watching and all our speakers. Thanks for having me. Great. Thanks again. Thanks for being here. Enjoy the rest. Yep. Bye all. Bye, have a great day. Great job, Maeve. Thanks. Give one more second. I'm going to stop recording.